Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to our webinar today, which is entitled The Cloud Architecture Behind ARIA. I hope you enjoy the content and welcome everybody on the webinar. My name is Charles Miss Campbell, Product Director for SpeakerBus. I'd like to introduce Tim Gabe. Hi, I'm Tim and I'm the Product Support Manager for SpeakerBus. So today we're going to be taking you through some of the technology and a preview of uh, enhancements to the ARIA front end. We won't run the webcam all day today, so it's a uh, goodbye visually from me and goodbye from him. And uh, I hope you enjoy the uh, the show today. Uh, if you're having any issues uh, seeing our content or with the webinar in general, please uh, pop some questions on the chat. Uh, we'll see that and try and take care of it for you. Uh, but without further ado, here we go. So ARIA, uh, the cloud architecture behind ARIA. So just to begin, I thought it would be good to just uh, refresh or introduce ARIA to people new to the product. ARIA is a new solution from SpeakerBus that's uh, in beta and coming out this year that provides critical voice services to users uh, for a number of scenarios. Uh, one of the primary drivers from our customer base was to have a software solution for business continuity purposes. If people can't access the building due to uh, natural disasters or other scenarios, then they wanted to be able to get into their trader voice solution uh, from a remote location. The second use case is for ad hoc remote working. We already have people leveraging ARIA in beta to access their trader voice services from home before or after work to enable extended working hours. And last but not least, as part of a general shift and trend to look at deploying Trader Voice as a software solution as part of a general UC strategy in the organization. So three use cases, customers are finding more, and I'm sure there'll be uh, plenty of additional interesting applications coming along in the future. So what's our solution? Well, ARIA delivers Trader Voice services via a browser. So it's turret in a browser. It deploys from a data center uh, or a hosting service or an in-house uh, server farm. And the benefits of this are that you get a high performance browser application. So the code is running in the browser. You're not waiting for web pages to refresh. And because it's powered through a browser, uh, JavaScript, HTML5 technology, um, you have zero software installation to worry about, no packaging, and you don't have to do any updating of that software because every session a user launches will go and get the latest version in the browser. Last but not least, you have free seating capability between our hardware environment and ARIA. It's completely native to the iManager iSeries um, product family and platforms, and therefore users can seat directly into ARIA without needing um, any additional services. And the user interface is based on our current user experience, which is called Slate, and we've carried that over to ARIA. So minimum retraining and maximum instant uh, intuitive operation there for users. So we've entitled the webinar Cloud Technology. I think it's first just a good idea to sort of put it out there. What is cloud? What does it mean in this context? So um, looking in the dictionary definition, cloud computing is the practice of uh, using remote servers hosted on the internet to store, manage, process data, and provide applications that would, uh, as instead of having local servers and personal computers. The cloud is evolving and, and, and rapidly becoming a, a massive part of our everyday lives in home and the business environment. So um, a definition of cloud technology from myself is that it's a controlled environment as a technology base that is highly automated, has a focus on the governance, security, and compliance uh, required to deliver the solution, but automation uh, replaces manual processes such uh, that you can support users in a scalable fashion um, with business rules, implementing the software so the environment's scalable, uh, predictable, and manageable as a technology platform. So that's what we mean by cloud technology in this context of ARIA. So we've got some polls running um, in our webinar today just to uh, ask around, um, what's your experience with cloud so far? So are you using uh, private, hybrid, or public cloud services and technology today? And also, in addition to our polls today, uh, we should have that one launched for you right now. Please ask questions to us at any time during the webinar. We are watching the screens, and uh, we'll try and answer them directly um, as they come up. So we'll leave the poll up uh, just for a few moments to give you a chance to click on your answers. While we just uh, move into what elements of ARIA and describe the pieces of the ARIA infrastructure that support its cloud credentials as a platform. 
So the first major observation you would make when you get your hands on an ARIA session is that it's a browser-based internet, internet technology. That essentially defines it as a cloud solution initially. It uses internet technology such as WebRTC. It uses HTML5, HTTPS, so it's secure. It can certainly be run over the internet, and we have and do run it over the internet today. Uh, we don't provide an actual public internet service of the solution. That's something that will be emerging through partners and our our, our channel partners and solution partners in the future as ARIA is uh, fully launched. We also support technologies such as Stun and Turn that does allow, um, and we have an example provided by Tim later, of uh, ARIA to be accessed behind home uh, internet router firewalls, for example, and uh, and deployed in a, in a, to any environment, to any user, including mobile. From an infra infrastructure perspective, ARIA supports physical and virtual server environments, and the media processing doesn't require any specific hardware. It is software powered. Also, our core control and the other elements are all server based uh, processes and, and operations in the back end. So you can roll ARIA out into your normal data center environments, be them hybrid, public or private. So we've had the results of the poll in, guys. Here's the update. 50% um, of you are, are engaging in hybrid uh, cloud solutions. We've got 38% using public and 13% coming up with, with private cloud solutions today. So thanks for your feedback on that interesting data. So when you have a cloud service, you expect it to scale. And one of the elements of ARIA that we work very hard on is to ensure that we've got application scalability built in from day one. So in the back end, you can run one to N application servers. You can add on elements uh, to enhance the scalability and the resources available to your deployment as you need to. And Tim will be running through the architecture in more detail to explain what those parts are. We also leverage Linux application containers as we run every individual session uh, for a live user in a container. We can grow that and it's a very resource efficient way of deploying applications in a server based environment. To keep everything uh, under control and managed, we have a lot of automation in the platform, which comes from um, inherited from the iManager centralized management system. So we have an enterprise management platform through the iManager portal that manages all your data centers from one instance up to a global deployment, maybe five, 10, 20 um, centers of, of provisioning uh, for ARIA. They're all managed through the same central global database with iManager portal. On top of that, uh, we have automated service discovery built into the ARIA backend. So the ability for applications to identify, um, locate resources, um, have those resources allocated to them for media processing, uh, codec transcode, for example, uh, all happen automatically. You don't have to predetermine them. They are managed and load balanced by the application itself. We also in the iManager centralized management system have a lot of policy driven permissions and co configuration parameters that makes ARIA a easy to manage at scale solution. From a compliance perspective, as well as having our policy driven um, elements to permissioning, control and configuration, uh, we also support all of our voice recording partners in the ARIA stack. Um, that happens at the data center so that the web sessions as they're deployed out to users are securely and compliantly recorded back at the data center. Uh, our APIs uh, provide that uh, through the cloud base uh, part of the architecture, which we'll describe shortly. And uh, also we support all of our feeds for things like call analytics and other partners leveraging our API stack at the back end. So it's compliant. And in terms of deployment, uh, things don't get much easier than browser. Once you have your infrastructure set up, well, HTML5 application is simply uh, authenticated to the user and they're on. Uh, they're up and running in literally a few seconds. And we'll show you that logon and um, application launch process when we do our live demo updating the new features of ARIA. So just a quick high level look at the architecture and we'll dig into that um, in the coming slides. So ARIA consists of the front end, which can run on any WebRTC uh, compliant browser, which can include PCs, laptops, tablets, and smartphones. The, um, the front end or cloud front, as we call it, is uh, provided from two pieces, uh, a web server and a WebRTC gateway. 
And behind that, the new stuff, cloud-based, the virtualization elements uh, consist of our virtualized applications and our virtualized media processing pieces um, running in the cloud-based piece. So this is a good time for me to, um, to welcome and hand over to, to Tim Game, who's going to take you through the detailed uh, technical architecture behind ARIA. And um, here we go, Tim, over to you. Hello. I hope you can all hear me okay. So as Charles mentioned, there's um, two deployment options, remote turret or fully virtual. First up, the iTurret as the host. This will give the user the ability to use all of his telephony, all of his PWs when he's away from his desk. Could be for home use, could be for DR, could be just because the train he can't get the train in. So um, this this architecture, this is our existing speaker bus architecture. Just need to get the pointer up and running, so we can you can see what we're talking about. Thank you. So existing architecture, so. HA gateways giving us high availability, PWs being terminated and delivered to the traders. Our iManager communication server doing call setup. Um, our ICMS server, our iManager communications um, centralized management system server. That holds all of the data, the profile information, the configuration, the pushing out of updates to endpoints. And our standard speaker bus ICDS interface, the calling data server that delivers all of the CDR records out to the voice recorders, our standard interface that we share with NICE, Redbox, and many other partners. None of that changes, that's our existing infrastructure. If you want to enable your traders to be able to connect to their turret remotely, they're gonna need a cloud front. So the cloud front is what's presented to the external interface, to the outside world. So what is cloud front? As Charles mentioned, there's two parts. There's the web server. This um, web server just uh, runs an IIS application that will present up the login web page and enable the users to authenticate with their credentials, the same credentials they would use on their turret back at the ICMS server to check that they are who they say they are. That will allow them to log on. And then we have this IGS server, our iManager gateway server, which is going to connect their web browser to their session controller, their turret in this case. And will establish media connection directly to the user. That will be an encrypted, secure audio session. H however much traffic's going on on the turret, it's one stream of audio down to the, t the trader, his um, web browser. So it's low bandwidth. It's not heavy utilization out there to the users. So what, what do these components look like in the flesh? We have um, them both here. So the first one up. The web interface will give you a standard login window. We're going to not log in right now. We're going to dive into that later when we give you the walkthrough. And then our IGS server is here. So the IGS, it will probably need re-logging into. No problems there. So this is the IGS server. As I mentioned, this is the gateway that's going to present the external world. We'll connect to that, those browsers. The media stream is going to connect through that and back to their session controller, which is, in this case, the remote tur the turret that they're remotely logging onto. From here, they can check the status of the server, get a, an idea of the health of it, so they can see it's not it's not really being burned and with many clients at the moment. The memory is completely available. There's not a lot going on. It's not heavily loaded, this one. There's a, one client connected at the moment, and you can see where they are. And it'll also enable you to other diagnostics and um, firmware upgrades if you need to upgrade the system. The, the, this, 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 this interface is primarily primarily aimed at your techies, the people who are going to support the equipment. So they can get a health check, they can get log files off it if they need to get support, they can uh, install security certificate. All the traffic is HTTPS, so it's fully encrypted out of the box. If you want your own certificate, because you, you, you like the green padlock, then you will enable you to upload your own certificate onto this. So that, that gives you a, a good look at CloudFront. Should we get back to this? So this will enable your users to be able to log on to their own turret remotely. As Charles has already mentioned, voice recording is as is. So that just works for them, fully compliant when they're working away from their desk. So then the next thing's a bit more exciting, which we wish to show you. Our fully virtualized turret. So this is quite exciting. It's, um, I think we're first time we're showing this in, in public, as it were. You're going to see what we've done in this. You'll see the only thing that's changed is we swapped out a turret for a, a virtual turret. That gives us a huge amount of possibilities in scalability, in security, everything's encrypted, in um, 
and it's in deployments it's you know sitting in your data center nice nicely safely tucked away being monitored so this this is um the change so cloud based what is it well it's comprised of two servers sorry one server has multiple functions so the icbs is our cloud based server that can run as a, a, a dsp server a container server i'll explain what that is in a minute or a codec server so to give you a bit of background on what that is the turret is comprised of three parts there's the user interface portion which is how he sees um, what displays on their screen the user interactions we represent that within a session controller or a linux container which is what we're calling the iDux, the i manager device user unified communications extension and that represents and is the virtual turret if you like the audio processing that's done on a turret we've pull that out of the server and put that onto a DSP server, which can heavy lift all of that audio processing. Um, and you can deploy multiples of those servers so they can load balance between them. And that will take care of all of the audio processing. And the third server in the box would be the codec server. This will do all of your complex codec encoding and transcoding for the low bit where it codecs such as G729 that need to be dealt with when you're hanging off a Cisco or something. So that, that cloud base will be for you one or more virtual turrets. So each turret being its own IDUX container. Otherwise, the, the rest of this architecture is exactly the same. So you don't have to worry about compliance. You don't have to worry about configuration. The same skills you have today will be deployed in using and supporting this. I've got Charles with me just to give us a brief why on uh, and detail some of our background thinking on the development history of the cloud base. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thanks, Tim. So uh, some of the rationale behind having this, uh, this, this uh, let's say, compartmentalized approach to providing the resources for ARIA was that uh, rather than having a single monolithic application, we wanted to ensure that not only could we scale ARIA up to our sort of theoretical 10,000 user database setting, but also that we could provide an optimal environment to take care of the resources needed to deliver the application. Now, when you have an eye turret on your, physically on your desktop, you have many options as to how you connect up uh, accessory sidecars to the turret. You can have additional key pages, you can add additional speaker units, and the way that uh, organizations use eye turret vary uh, widely from a fairly thin telephony style application using the buttons more for speed dial purposes, right out to a fully expanded brokerage turret running 24 speaker channels. The implications of having this modularity are that when you virtualize that, you have the potential to be using either a lot more media processing or having a very low processing requirement focused mainly, mainly around the, the session controller element or the application element. So if we designed it as a mon monolithic application, we would have been in a situation where we would have had to test it every instance for the maximum resource utilization of lots of codecs running, lots of DSP and speaker channel activity. And that would have meant probably overscaling our estimations of the backend resources uh, to cope with the worst case scenario. The beauty of having this distributed processing uh, between various elements of CloudBase is that as you see uh, through your reporting tools, the utilization increasing on DSP because you have users accessing the service to perhaps uh, do more brokerage speaker functions, then you can decide to add additional iManager cloud-based servers and configure those as DSP resources. And as soon as they're online, um, then the session controllers will identify those and your least loaded uh, DSP server will start to attract the traffic demands from those clients. So you can now have a optimal backend processing environment that could be uh, virtualized or uh, bare metal based or a hybrid combination of both indeed that is set up and optimized for the correct uh, media processing transcode or application workload that is put onto it. That enables tweaking and optimization of the hardware uh, as we learn more and more about the 
the resource demands of these various components, we can start to provide very tailored recommendation as to memory, uh, CPU, local CPU, memory cache, for example, um, and optimize the cost performance uh, benefits of those uh, components for customers. So a little bit of the rationale behind why we've gone for a, a distributed um, multi-server environment. And the other thing just to, to note is, of course, when you're not running uh, your complete solution on a single server as, as one large monolithic application, you obviously increasing the resilience of the solution dramatically uh, because we're distributing functions and workloads around. We're increasing the reliability of the solution and the ability to service various components at will. So a little insight into the rationale behind our development of cloud-based for you there. Okay, thank you, Charles. So what does a cloud-based look like? Well, it's virtual, so there's not much to look at, I'm afraid. But we'll give you a quick show of one we have in action, sitting here working. Um, I'll just check the status of it. And it's reporting back to me. It's currently running. I'll let it finish, giving me the detail. As you can see, there's a number of turrets here. There's actually 10. These are each individually addressable on the network turrets. They've got their own MAC address and their own IP address. They are currently connected to ICMS is good. So a user can come and sit at a turret. They just need to log on. They're good to go. And they're good and connected to SIP. So they're ready for telephony. So I've got 10 turrets here ready to go, ready for us to show you what it looks like from the front end. So let's jump back here. So that's cloud-based, our fully scalable, fully virtual and secure virtual turret. So in practice, how are you going to deploy this? Now, you've got two options, really. You've got over the VPN for a user to connect, or you're going to have to do it straight over the internet. So we're going to give you a bit of background on one of the other technologies we're utilizing here, which is um, if you're not using a VPN, then you need to be able to let your users log in from anywhere. And we're going to use Stun, Turn and Ice to uh, deploy this stuff. There's a lot of information here. Stun is simple traversal over of UDP through NATs and turn traversal using relay NAT protocols. But I'll give you a, a, a diagram, which will probably make things a bit clearer. So if your users are sitting out there in the world, if we take, for instance, Donald, he's roving around on his phone. He wants to connect back to his IGS server. IGS server, to be able to set up the session between Donald and the server itself, it needs to know the public IP addressing of the devices. And we'll employ STUN to do that. That's a standard internet-based protocol that allows devices to work out their own IP address. And because Donald's not sitting behind another firewall, we can negotiate the audio directly to those public IP addresses. So in this case, Orange representing the audio traffic goes straight to his handset. Hillary, on the other hand, is at home. She's behind a standard kind of home broadband router which also employs um, a NAT traversal. So when the, the session's initiated and set up there, STUN is used again so that both ends can find out the public IP address. But because the media cannot pass straight through that firewall unfettered, what we use is TURN to act as a relay point. And that TURN server would be out there on the internet to relay the media between Hillary and the IGS server, as, as represented by the orange there. So we've got another poll for you now. We've introduced a kind of an ed educational section in this webinar, and we just want to get some feedback from you, how you feel about those. So if you could um, give us some info and feedback to us, how you're getting on. I think up next, Charles is going to give us a, a nice run through of the latest features that are on the, uh, the user interaction and how they would see that in practice. So thank you, Tim. Uh, hopefully that's been a, a useful insight into how we build out the back end for ARIA and what those elements consist of, how they interact, and also some of the technologies that are used uh, by cloud services and internet services such as Stun and Turn to enable access from anywhere and how some of these uh, services can uh, assist you in keeping your situation and your environment very secure by having multiple firewalls with uh, network address, address translation and, and how you overcome these things. Um, just. Anecdotally, really, uh, quite a few of these services, you can obviously build your own. You can build out your own stun turn services using regular off-the-shelf software components in your own data center using in your own uh, DMZ. But there are free services out there provided by organizations such as Google and others, which you can use for uh, proof of concept test and um, as a reference resource as well. So we've been using those very successfully over the, over the last few months. Poll results are in. So 75% say, yep, 
let's have some more educational content. So we'll keep that up in future webinars. No one says no, thank you. And some are not sure. Well, maybe we should deliver them in a slightly more fun manner. <laughs> but uh, there we go. Thank you for your responses to the poll. So the other element we wanted to cover today on the webinar was just to give you an update really on the user interface, some of the new elements that have been added to ARIA um, in the last couple of months as our teams have been very busy getting this ready for its uh, general availability release. So I'm going to pop around to window, I'm just going to quickly move to a blank slide here and find my browser where I should be able to log on to ARIA. Here we go. And um, so we're state we're at now. Let's just refresh and give you the full experience. So I've just refreshed my web page with a hard refresh. So we've loaded HTML content from our IIS server, and we've downloaded all of the JavaScript behind that, which enables the web app to operate. I enter my credentials in here, and I hit login. So these would be unique for every user. And as you can see, we've connected straight through, and we're now going through the connection to the session controller. So we're going to mute the audio. What we have running here that you've just heard are two audio sources, one from a Bloomberg TV, and another one from a sound check disc, which, uh, which we just run so that when you log into our ARIA demo, you have uh, the ability to see the functionality of, uh, of speaker channels um, working in real life. Um, so we've logged in. Uh, we're securely connected through ARIA into our back end. And what I'm just going to do now is run through some of the new features as a bit of an update on where, how we're getting on with our, with our user interface here. So ARIA can run as an expanded window, but if you want to use your PC um, for other things, you're probably going to make the choice to uh, run it less than expanded and probably not full screen. And in support of that, ARIA has from day one supported adaptive HTML, which we showed on our first demo. And you may well get to a situation where you kind of want to bring ARIA down to the corner um, and have it running um, in a smaller window. So that's great. Um, and you've got Windows hotkeys, which will let you do that kind of thing as well. So let's just say we're going to run about a, a quarter of our screen with ARIA. But we want to actually customize our view. So we've enabled pop outs to happen with ARIA. So we could now say, well, hey, if you're just looking to have your inbound calls or your call activity shown and you're going to hide everything else, then you could pop call activity out into a separate window. So we have now pop outs for any panel in ARIA can be separated from the main window and dragged out and customized in terms of size and location or even zoom level across the whole application, okay, to get your desktop layout optimal uh, for your usage environment. So that's been a good enhancement. And for example, the key pages ones here, you could be looking at speed dials and just have them set up. So you have your, your classic speed dial pages just ready to go on your screen at any time. You can drag any of these panels back in from the main app, and you can also close them remotely, and they'll drag back in to your main app. OK, so we've got those elements. One of the things that's um, incredibly useful is the ability to minimize your browser and have a, uh, a, a notification that some activity is going on. So let's just take the call activity uh, pop out out here and show you things in parallel, I guess. So I'm minimizing my 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 main ARIA app, but I'm, I'm looking out to see who's calling me. But maybe I turn away uh, to do something else. And if we get an inbound call, you can now see we've got two notifications. Uh, we've got the main uh, ringing. Well, we'll just keep that muted because it's kind of loud. Uh, we've got the main ringing showing in my call activity screen. Um, but I might have that filtered only to show calls in progress, for example. And just down on the bottom right, you should see incoming call alert. So this is a desktop notification that comes as part of a, a number of up-to-date browsers. And we're just implementing those, accessing that desktop notification through the standard process. This is Chrome. Um, you can do them in Firefox, I believe. And as other browsers support WebRTC, you should be getting those, those pop-up notifications. Uh, if Tim just calls me back, then I'll just show you what happens when we hit that. So if you click on an incoming call, it'll restore focus to your main application, okay? So you can actually handle that call and continue working. So very neat, no plugins, no software to install. ARIA through the uh, HTML, taking advantage of 
And up there at the top there, you see where I dialed a few calls in, you've got a missed call indicator. Oh, thanks, Tim. We have indeed. Uh, so we've got those desktop notifications in there, um, notifications. Uh, we've got our ability to now go and see missed calls. So is this the right one, Tim? Yep. If you just pulled out. So that, that'll, uh, if you have a look at the call register below this. Let's have a look. Ah, uh -huh, here we go. You can see Absolutely. So we'll get away to the call queue. Let's take a call, uh, a look at the call, the call log. So this is our call register or call log. The call log enables you to see all your made, um, received and missed calls. And we can see there that we had a missed call from Tim. Uh, we could call him back. Um, we can also filter it. So if you can say, uh, take away the calls I've made, um, take away the ones I've received and just show me missed calls. And those are persistent results. So you can tick those and you can also clear them. Uh, so get rid of the boldness of the ones that you uh, haven't notified or read. And you can also clear the list as well. There are some other neat um, elements as well, and that is you've got a new menu preference around that uh, so that you can actually go in here and you can take away uh, the call log auto collapse. Now, what that means is the call log today, um, every time that you've uh, finished looking at it, it'll automatically minimize itself. So you're making best use of your screen real estate. You can now turn that feature on and off. So if you always like to have your call log visible, uh, you, can, you can leave it visible on the screen. Uh, moving neatly on, we've also got a new feature up here for um, showing microphone activity. One of the bits of feedback we saw uh, when we first launched the ARIA front end was people said, please could we know which channels we're talking on, when our microphones are active, uh, just so that we can be um, fully aware of those sessions and what's going on. So you can see that I'm on a phone call with Tim right now on the top handset, virtual handset channel. Uh, if I opened up my, uh, let's say my, my tradition, private line speaker channel now, you can see that I'm now talking on two channels. So as we have this ability to shift our talk or our microphone transmit between any of these channels in ARIA, the green light is uh, not only showing that it's active, but as it turns on and off, if I pause for a moment, the lights go out and you can actually see your activity on those channels. Uh, not forgetting our super mute as well, which will turn everything on and off and toggle that for you from a single click at the top of the screen. So that's a good reminder, Tim. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll hang up that call and get back to the list of features. So we've got our voicemail indication now baked into the ARIA client. So if you have a voicemail, uh, you'll see an indication um, lamping up at the top here. And also you get to call directly back uh, to voicemail. I'm just going to mute my, uh, my Bloomberg feed here so that we don't get that too loud and I can reactivate my speakers. And so single click. Welcome to Audix. Well, straight out time, press. into your voicemail. So familiar functionality from feature phones and soft phones uh, getting added into ARIA all the time. You can also set up full calling, uh, call forwarding now from, um, if I can find it from the right place, uh, call forward menu. So you can now set any number you want to. So set it to your home number uh, and you can set your options for call forwarding, whether it's going to call forward all calls, um, if you don't answer or if you're busy on your prime extensions uh, to head off uh, to an alternate number, very useful. Standard feature phone function there. We've also uh, got our ability to uh, auto answer calls on a free handset. ARIA has uh, two virtual handset channels. Um, you can actually disable them if you don't want both of them and have just a single one. And the idea here is uh, you can be busy on, um, I've got to find a number to call. Uh, Nine, one, two, three. Or... Do that one. Uh, so I've just dialed into a conference bridge, and the idea behind this feature is um, I could have another inbound call um, as as expected. Tim's calling me now because I'm probably sitting here on a USB headset or something similar using Aria. Then if I accept Tim's call, it'll automatically put it onto the second handset if you enable that feature. That's great. It enables you to work in in real time. It automatically mutes the original call enabling you to basically call handle like a superstar and switch between um, various calls incredibly quickly to take calls to increase the performance of users in terms of multiple call handling in that environment. So a neat new feature inherited from iTurret and now added to ARIA as we've continued in development. And the last but not least in the webinar uh, is uh, just to show some fairly obvious uh, Safety feature, it's really easy uh, when you're in a Windows environment to, to, to close windows too quickly or with multiple tab browsers, you could be uh, 
you know, looking at something and then have it set to automatically close all tabs. And the idea behind this feature is to prevent that. So we've got a warning now, a standard browser warning, warning you that you're about to close your session. Do you want to leave this site and allowing you to stay on the site and not shut down uh, your ARIA phone session in that environment? So incredibly useful. Uh, little safety feature getting built in there uh, with more to come. We still have some additional features under development pre to GA, prior to GA, but that's the update of those features for you today. And I hope they've been uh, been useful and insightful. Uh, other status menu items such as network, etc., still up there and we have everything good to go on this uh, on this session, thankfully today. So that's my look at ARIA. Um, don't remember to don't forget to log out when you've uh, finished your session. And that closes down everything securely and, and leaves no footprint on the browser either to help with security. So we uh, thank you for your time today. And please do fire in any last questions you may have today in, into, the, uh, into the chat question box in the webinar panel. We've got some. So let's get to the questions that have been submitted. And over to you, Tim. OK, so we had a number of questions. I'll take the first one off the list. Do we need any spe special browser plugins to make this work, Charles? Uh, no, we don't, Tim. ARIA requires no special browser plugins. Um, everything is HTML and um, WebRTC compliant out of the box on supporting browsers. And follow up question on that one. Does it take much bandwidth down to the browser? No, and you can actually read the bandwidth out of your browser diagnostics, but it's a roughly 80 kilobits per second for the encrypted stream. Yep. Thank you. And we've got a question on the spec of the server we're showing here. I probably should take that one. Seeing as I Please do, it. Tim. <laughs> so the server we're actually using is a Supermicro Blade server for this demonstration. It's a 128 gig SSD drive with 24 cores and 16 gig of RAM. To answer that question directly, we're currently in the testing phase of that, but the follow-up question that someone submitted is how many containers can we run on that? So far, we've successfully spun up to 50 on one, one of those servers, but we're still pushing hard with that. I think that we could add to that though, that that's without using all the cores at all. That's correct, yes. Yeah. It's not, it's, it's only pairing at the moment. Yeah. So the the reason for those, um, those high spec servers in our test environment is that our intention is to obviously provide significant stress testing and load testing and um, some and scientific measurement. We're actually using ARIA to provide uh, test traffic for, for other facilities and products that we make as well in our, in our lab environments. We will be publishing some comprehensive kind of science-based guides on, on server optimization and server requirements um, as we get closer to GA later this year. Okay, that's good, thank you. Um, there's a follow-up question on, do we need special servers to run this? Which is in the same. No, category. indeed. Uh, this this will run. Uh, so basically, Aria runs on a CentOS um, environment. It's a Linux software uh, operating system, and you can run it on pretty much any spec server. Obviously, the memory and CPU speed of that server will give you your resultant capacity, and uh, that's part of the science that Tim's team are doing right now is to see how this operates on on various Xeon uh, processors with different types of RAM different quantities of RAM uh, to make sure we can provide that that guidance. And that, that also feeds into, um, we've got a follow-up question about using virtual servers there, which essentially is we're doing the, the, the due diligence, but yes, virtual servers are a, a, on the plan. Absolutely, so you can virtualize ARIA backend and cloud-based. The, uh, the important elements to consider uh, when you are looking at, at virtualization is not to expect to get free uh, capability out of your virtualization hardware stack, okay? Uh, ARIA requires CPU cycles to do media processing, encryption, and codec transcode, and to run the actual user application. So provided that you have a suitably scaled uh, virtualization environment, you can absolutely run ARIA on those virtualization environments. Yeah, and I'll just add, we're looking at VMware with that and the Microsoft Hyper-V as, as the environment. I don't think we've been asked this one yet. How do we record this soft phone? So uh, the iSeries platform, all of our current uh, NGEN products, all have a standard recording API, which is provided for, through um, what we call the iCDS server and uh, is used by our partners to access recordings. So if you have an existing installation of iTurret, 708 speakers or intercoms you'll find and you have that recorded you'll find that the aria sessions can record directly into that interface okay so uh, the it's the standard i series backend api uh, records aria it's the same interface api and messages that are used to record iturret 
and the same media streams. So we have another question. If the browser crashes, what happens? Oh, great question. So the application is session aware. If the browser crashes, um, it depends on the style of crash. The worst case would be that you uh, essentially have to restart your browser. So yeah. we all have these experiences from time to time when we have a browser that maybe freezes during our uh, late night visit to Amazon.com or whatever. And, um, and, and Aria is no different. Essentially, you need to have a working live browser session you will be returned to a a window like this uh, where you'll have to re-authenticate and you're you simply re-log in uh, authenticate and you'll be uh, connecting straight back through so it doesn't leave any sessions or any any back doors open if your browser crashes once okay. we lose Absolutely. the uh, once we lose the uh, the signaling stream between the browser and the session controller we essentially terminate that session and require reauthentication and the calls would be cleared down that you're in any um, pws up on speaker would be reestablished as you see when charles logged back in any active telephone calls would be cleared so just time for one last follow up question if we log out if we log in and have pop-out panels, do we have to rearrange them every time we log in? I, I do not know the answer to that question. <laughs> I've not tried that one. I believe it recalls how you were last there. So. I believe they were persistent, right? Um, so let's have a pop-out panel and do a quick test. We're running out of time, but let's have a quick go at this one. So this is the scenario, right? Yeah. Um, where we're going to have some pop-outs and we're going to log out of ARIA. Nothing like some live science to keep things exciting here in London on a Wednesday afternoon. So we're logging back in. Looks like it's re uh, reconnected oh, our pop-out. The pop-up blocker of uh, Chrome, actually, in the top. Uh, oh, has it? Blocked it? it? Yeah. Oh, we've got the pop-up blocker turned on. So, so let's always enable those. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'd have to do that one again, right? Uh, which one did I pop out? I can't remember. Uh, let's do another post. quick test. So we should have pop-up blockers enabled. Probably shouldn't do this on a live webinar, but hey. So there we go. Let's close ourselves out. Let's log back in, see if we get a pop-up establishment. That's a great question and happy to try and answer it. So we'll let that conclude. I think that's our questions for today. We really thank you. Okay, so it's a re-established the pop-out, but it hasn't remembered the location. Uh, we could take a look at that. But yes, your pop-outs, if, you if you don't have your pop-up blocker on, it will certainly uh, pop out again. So we'll have to see. Um, I think you might find it's browser behavior dependent. Um, I certainly know we do attempt to store the uh, the X, Y coordinates of these pop-outs and make them persistent, but it may be a browser dependent behavior. Okay, thank you for that. I think that's it for the questions. That's great. So I'm Charles, uh, Miss Campbell, Speaker Bus. This is Tim Game. If you'd like to contact us, our details are on the screen. This webinar will be republished on YouTube via speakerbus.com as soon as possible. And please do follow us on our social media channels. Um, thank you for joining. And we hope you found today informative and useful. We'll see you next time.